What do Christians mean when they say that God is a judge? From time to time, you'll have thought or said out loud, that's just not fair. When I watch the football team I support and I see what I believe to be an infringement of the rules, I find myself on my feet almost instinctively. How much more so when we see people mistreated or agreed principles ignored? Our sense of fairness and unfairness goes deep. I think that this sense of fairness, of justice, is important when we come to ask what Christians mean when they say that God is a judge. A good judge is a person with authority, identified with what is good and right, just and fair. A good judge ought to be a person of wisdom, discerning and able to get to the truth. When we consider some of the cruel and harmful actions which we as humans inflict on one another, or the unjust systems which allow some to flourish while others can't, and the long-term impact of societal sins such as slavery or sexual violence, it seems important to say that these things will not be overlooked or dismissed simply as of no account. When Christians assert that God is a judge, it's an important means of saying that these things matter, they're to be taken very seriously and that there will be an accounting for them. This is, in part, seen by some Christians as being tied up with a final accounting before God for the way we've lived our individual and collective lives. But if God is judge, then we're also called to live justly and to pursue justice now. Moreover, when Christians say that God is a judge, it's important to set this in the wider context of what Christians believe about the nature of God that God is loving and forgiving. Thus, when we speak of God as judge, we typically do so in the very same breath as we say that God is also merciful. Why do Christians describe God as personal? In answer to that question, it's probably helpful to think a little about what we mean by personal. How might we understand the difference between an inanimate object, such as an asteroid, or an intangible concept such as freedom, and a person, such as my friend? A key difference might involve the animated nature of my friend, who has a consciousness, a mind, emotions and a will, in contrast to those other things. Christians talk of God as having consciousness, a rational being with self-awareness, an intellect, emotions, and a will or volition. Such an understanding sees God as personal. So, along with the followers of all three Abrahamic faiths, Christians understand God to be a personal being, not simply an object, force, or concept. Furthermore, a being who can be known the Christian understanding of God as a being who is personal is closely linked to the Christian belief that God is relational. It is possible to be in a relationship with a being in a way which it just isn't with an object, such as an asteroid or an abstract concept, such as freedom. Why might Christians describe God as relational? Firstly, and uniquely, the Christian doctrine of the Trinity emphasises that we worship God as three distinct persons within one divine being. That means that we believe that loving and dynamic relationship is core to the nature of God. Secondly, Christians believe that it is from this loving relationship which exists within God that the impetus comes for the outward expression of love through which God creates, sustains and redeems. God, whose nature is love, proactively reaches out to be in relationship with created beings, including you and I. 
in the scriptures, God's relational character is reflected in God's faithful love expressed towards individuals, communities, nations and the whole of creation. God even defines God's self in terms of relationships. I am the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac and the God of Jacob. God enters into covenants, deep promises and commitments with people. Thirdly, the Christian doctrine of the Incarnation emphasises yet further the understanding of God as personal. In Jesus we say, God took on flesh and dwelt among us. Jesus, fully human and fully God, makes God fully relational and personal. How can God be loving if people suffer? The vexed question of whether God truly can be loving if people suffer is one that believers within the Christian, Jewish and Muslim faiths have wrestled with for a very long time. This of course is not simply an academic question, but one which affects every one of us because sadly, suffering is a part of life. None of us escape it in one form or another. Understandably, the problem of suffering and evil is one of the reasons that some people choose to be atheists. Much has been written and much discussed on this topic, and we can only touch on some aspects of this question in so short a time as we have now. Moral evil is a term used to describe that behaviour of human beings which causes suffering. Such behaviour as stealing, lying, betrayal, selfishness, violence and murder. Natural evil describes those things over which human beings have no control, such as earthquakes, disease, floods and droughts. Though some might argue that the impact of these, especially where they disproportionately have an impact on the most vulnerable, may indeed be influenced by human decisions and actions. Despite the difficulty of reconciling the idea of a loving God with the existence of suffering, of moral and natural evil, Christians, including many who have suffered greatly themselves, still hold on to the claim that God is loving. One can suggest that the existence of moral evil, the suffering which comes because we as human beings inflict it on one another and on creation, doesn't argue against Christianity. Rather, it may help reinforce the Christian assertion that humanity has gone awry and has need of God and the standards of care towards one another which God asks of us. Moreover, the free will which God has given us, our self-agency and awareness, without which we could not be persons, also comes with the responsibility to choose between good and evil. Moral evil is found in our failure to choose the good, our sin. Natural evil might be seen by some as part of a world driven by natural processes which actually make life possible, such as plate tectonics and weather systems. Accordingly, while this is not a perfect world, it is part way to the best possible world. Others might also point to the wider predicament whereby we live in a fallen world for now and the whole of creation is longing for renewal which God will one day bring to pass. As we consider not just the question why do people suffer but the specific question how can God be loving when people suffer? I would draw us to the person of Jesus Christ. God who loves so much that he came to live amongst us, to draw us back, to be reconciled to God and to deal with the moral evil which besets us. In Jesus, we encounter God who shares in our suffering, the grief and sorrow of those who mourned, who were filled with anxiety, who sat beside those whom they loved who were sick, who lived under the boot of an occupying power. 
a loving God who shares the pain of those who suffer, not passively, but actively, who promises that there will come a day when God will wipe away every tear from our eyes and when there will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain. God, who in the meantime asks Christians to join in, comforting the brokenhearted, visiting the prisoner, feeding the hungry and setting the oppressed free.